So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, this topic. Uh, it's uh, actually a collection of several projects I've been doing uh, over the last few years with the help of these people. Somebody in the room, Frederick Omer, are here. Oscar is not here, but he says hi. Um, so let me start with a question. Why are we here? Why did we come to Santa Cruz? To be honest, at least partly because of that. <laughs> <coughs> so this is a picture I took Wednesday. It's just a couple of miles south from Santa Cruz on the, on the California one to Big Sur. If you happen to go there, uh, please look around this area in the sun. You might find my car keys. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> so, a few hours, long hours later, and uh, almost $600 after that, <laughs> I'm here, enjoying the nice weather, the nice food, fantastic landscape, and you enjoy these things even more if, like me, you're based in the UK. <laughs> so, why are we here? Maybe more seriously, we are here because we have a problem. Let's face it. We are basing our understanding of the formation, the evolution of galaxies on things like that, big scale cosmological simulations, combined with zoom simulations, zoom means uh, when we can better describe with higher resolution, with better physics, what's actually happening. And you see, it in particular in this movie, how important feedback is, stellar feedback, agent feedback. So how star formation is important. But the problem is that in this simulation, are they are equivalent from other groups. We don't resolve galaxies. We don't resolve the environment where star formation is taking place. It's not enough to have a few cells or a few particles per this scale height, so 100-ish parsec. We don't resolve the clouds where star formation takes place. So we don't know how star feedback is injected, the structure of the interstellar medium. And we have the same problem about the AGN feedback. So having this problem, the solution that we have adopted is bad. But we don't have much choice. We use subgrid recipes or subparticle recipes. So we have different flavors of that. Some of us use the density threshold for star formation, and we know it's bad. We uh, have some description for star formation efficiency, and it's wrong. We assume universal IMF most of the time, and then we, we know it's wrong. And we try to guess or to fine tune our model for select for, for self feedback energy and momentum, and it's bad. And we do that for many other topics. And basically, what we do, we put all this in our codes and we cross our fingers. But it's not working. And why it's not working? For so many reasons, let me pick a few examples. So, this is actually where star formation is taking place. And uh, Joel showed this, uh, this object already, the, the uh, Rosette Nebulae. And can, I think it's really great that. You see this kind of object twice in the galaxy formation workshop. We're already going there. So we know that star formation is taking place. It has been uh, confirmed by Herschel recently. You see the formation of massive stars still embedded in their clouds here. But the thing is that stars and gas do not evolve the same way. So at some point, they will decouple. And uh, they decouple because of disk dynamics, kiloparsec scale dynamics through asymmetric drift, so the rotation of the disk, through shear, through tides, for example. And this is not predictable. This is quite important. This could be several 10 kilometers per second difference between the stars and the cloud in which you form. So this means that at this scale, 40-ish parsec cross, you can exit the molecular cloud within a few million years. So this means that you, before even the, the stars explode as a supernova, it's already in low density environment or even it's outside of the cloud. So to quantify that, I used the simulation of the Milky Way that we have been doing. So it's isolated disk subparsic resolution. You see, here you see the, the map for the gas in the central region. So you see the bar and part of the spiral arms. And on top of that, I'm plotting the intensity of this decoupling force between the stars and the gas. So when you are in the red, reddish regions, this decoupling is very strong, very efficient. If you are in the bluish or greenish regions, it's much weaker. And so you see a clear dichotomy between what's happening, for example, here at the tip of the bar and what's happening in the spiral arms. After only 10 million years after the stars form, you can have a variation of the gas density of factor 100 from the stars from here and the stars from there. So this means that since the stars is the supernova exploding a different gas density, the effect of feedback depends on where they form, are dependent on the environment within the galaxy. 
And I think this is kind of interesting case for, for your community because um, you see the decoupling is more efficient at the center of the galaxy. So here you have a way without fine tuning anything to remove low angular momentum gas. Having a given stellar feedback recipe, whatever it is, you can eject more easily, more efficiently, low angular momentum gas, which would help to, um, to avoid the problem you, you face in galaxy formation. So these particular examples and others make me think that the galactic scale is kind of a sweet spot in simulation of galaxy and their content. Because if you look at galaxy formation picture, well, we cannot have infinite resolution, so you basically don't resolve the GMCs where star formation is taking place. But if you make simulation of molecular clouds much higher, uh, much smaller scales and better physics, then you don't account for disk dynamics. So you cannot see the coupling between the two. You, can, you completely miss this uh, cloud star decoupling. But right in between, at the scale of galaxies, it's not perfect. Of course, we don't have good initial conditions, we don't have good physics, but at least we are in this tiny sweet spot where we can study things like that. So, we are here, we have these bad subgrid recipes, and we are doing even worse, that we fine tune, we, we calibrate these subgrid recipes on uh, and full of observations on, on other simulations, but we don't know who they will apply to other environments. For example, starburst galaxies in pairs, interacting galactic pairs, in clusters or groups, or at higher redshift. So we don't know that what we put in our code will still work in there. So one way to improve that, to make the, these subgrid recipes better, is to actually understand the physics. So let me focus on star formation and on the extreme case. Uh, yeah, we are in trouble. <laughs> the extreme case would be a starburst uh, environment. So these are the famous antenna galaxies, two galactic disks colliding together, creating these huge tidal tails, 110 kiloparsec across. And the antenna galaxies are mostly famous for their central region, where you see a lot of star formation activity. In particular, in the two nuclei that weren't merged yet, you see a lot of star formation because of inflows. You have gravitational torques on one galaxy onto the other, and in cycle rotation, you fuel the gas inwards, it spikes up at the center, and forms a lot of stars. This is well known, this is well understood. But the antenna galaxies are mostly famous for this overlap region here. You have formation of massive star clusters, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 beasts. Very young, less than 8 million years here. So why do you have such a star, such a star formation activity, such efficient activity? Well, it makes sense that because it's in the overlap between the two galaxies that a cloud from one galaxy could collide with a cloud from another galaxy. And we know that cloud cloud collision makes star formation more efficient, in particular massive star formation. So maybe cloud cloud collisions, but we are not sure that these events are frequent enough. So to be honest, I don't know. In any case, how do you explain star formation in these regions? Not in the nuclei, not in the overlap, actually on the other side of the galaxy. You have also the formation of massive star clusters more or less the same masses than here. But you clearly don't have cloud collisions, you don't have inflows. So what is triggering that star formation activity? See, if I want to rephrase the problem, I seek a relation between large-scale distant effect of galactic interaction and subparsec effect of star formation. One way of doing that is through gravitational torques and nuclear inflows, as in the galactic centers. Another way is through cloud cloud conditions, but we don't know exactly how efficient it is. But we need something else. It's not to replace those, it's something in addition, working in different environments. And I'm proposing, as, as Nia nicely introduced, a theory based on tidal compression and turbulence compression. So why should we care about tides in such problem? Well, if you look at the genes mass uh, expression, the one you, you find in textbooks, this is what you have and you don't have anything about tides. So what Chandra Jack did is to redirect the genes mass, having this correction factor where lambda is the strength of the tidal field. So with no tides, lambda equals zero, and you retrieve the classical expression for the genes mass as planned. That's good. In classical tidal field, when you stretch the matter along at least one axis, this is called the extensive mode, then your lambda is positive. And then your genes mass is larger than usual. And it makes sense, right? If you stretch the matter, it's more difficult to make it collapse. But there is also another tidal mode called compressive mode, when instead of stretching the matter, you compress it along all directions. And in that case, lambda is negative, and your genes mass is smaller than usual. So again, it makes sense, right? If you compress the matter, your ISM is 
uh, less stable. So you could say this is just a mathematical trick. This is not really relevant in the universe. Actually, it's true for isolated galaxies, but not for interacting galaxies. Here you see a very simple model of two interacting uh, disk galaxies. And in red, you see the region in compressive tides. So you see that at the time of the collisions, like right now, now, you see that these red compressive regions become very important. You change the nature of tides because of the galactic interaction, because of the galactic collisions. And you don't do that over tiny regions. It's kiloparsec scales. It's over large volumes. This is not only true for this particular case. This is valid for more or less all mergers. You can play with the mass ratio, with the orbits, pin orbit coupling, etc. You will always reach this conclusion. So, OK, we have compressive tides in interacting galaxies. And how do we? take this energy and make it cascade down to the scale of star formation. Why well, turbulence can do that. So again, as Nia said uh, yesterday, in classical galaxy, in isolated disk, because of energy cool partition, this is what the energy budget of turbulence looks like. You get two thirds of the turbulence in this solenoidal mixing effect. And the remaining third is in the compressive effect, which is the one responsible for enhancing the contrast between low and high density. So I would say that this, this works well in isolated galaxy, basically in the regime where the tumor, cre, tumor Q parameter works uh, from, from this, uh, this theory in 64. But then a few years later, the tumor brothers realized that uh, you, you can find more interesting environment than just a single disk. What's happening in interacting galaxies? And actually, it seems that it's more interesting where right? you get slightly more citations <laughs> about the star formation, the, the interacting galaxy paper than the tumor stability criterion. So to look at that, I'm following the steps of tumor and tumor with slightly more particles. So we made a simulation of the internal galaxies with gas, hydro, parsec resolution. This is a bad thing about turbulence. You need crazy resolution because you need to measure turbulence over a large volume of a large number of uh, resolution elements. So I will skip over the technical details. Let's have a look at turbulence in this simulation. At the beginning of simulations, be before the interaction itself, the two disks are still isolated. So in isolation, we have energy repartition. And as expected, you have more or less two thirds of the energy in solenoidal, in the mixing mode, and one third in compressive mode. So as usual. Then the two galaxies interact, separate, fall back on each other, and merge. And at the at final coalescence, you again have one isolated galaxy. So again, energy repartition, and we are back to the same stage as uh, the beginning. But in between, you've changed the relative importance of the two, the, the two turbulent mode. The turbulent, the compressive sorry, mode takes over and dominates. So what does it mean? This means that because of this change in the tidal field, you also change the nature of turbulence in the, in the interacting system. So if you change the nature of turbulence, this means that you change the way your interstellar medium fragments. And if you can propagate these changes down to the scale of protostellar cores, subparsec scales, then that could mean that you change your IMF into a bottom AV uh, IMF if, I, if I'm following the analytical work by Shabrieta. Of course, I'm not proving that in the simulation. So I'm, I, I'm, it's still, uh, uh, it's not, it's not uh, sure at all. Because we don't know, we are not sure how this kind of turbulence will dissipate. If, it's, if it dissipates the same way than the classical turbulence or not. So if I put all the pieces of the together, let's have a look at the evolution in time along the merger or of the long range distance gravitational effect, compressive tides. And you see here basically what you saw in the, in the movie with the red regions. It's peaking more or less at the time of the very center passages. Then, the hydrodynamical effect, smaller scales, compressive turbulence. And finally, the small scale effect, net effect, star formation rate. You see that the three quantities follow each other very nicely. They have the same behaviors, they peak at the same moment. There is kind of time delay between it takes some time to propagate this long range distance effect, large scale effect from types to star formation rate. So you get this time delay of 20 to 30 million years. So now I'm reaching my conclusions. Um, star formation and feedback are environment dependent. From galaxy to galaxy, obviously, but also within a given galaxy. Don't forget that. There is a coupling between large scales and small scales through turbulence, 
through cloud-style decoupling, for example, through feedback. Star formation is closely related to supersonic turbulence in isolated galaxies and, and with this modified kind of turbulence in interacting galaxies. You change the nature of tides and turbulence in galaxy mergers and probably, although it's still very speculative, the MF. Thank you. So how do you uh, separate out the compressive versus solenoidal modes? Are you measuring, so you're doing like a Helmholtz decomposition on the gas distribution, but, uh, but what gas do you include? When, you know, the solen for people who, you didn't give a math definition, but mm -hmm. a solenoidal field has a curl, a compressive yeah. mode has a divergence, or? Exactly, exactly. Uh, so solenoidal is right. uh, um, divergent free, and compressive is curl free. Right. So, so I do that about the entire gas. For the entire gas. So gas. is any of the, I mean, some of the curl might be related to large scale rotation in the disk, or how do you? So you, before, before you do this decomposition, Helmholtz or curl or whatever, you have to subtract the mean uh, velocity field, basically the average large scale motion, which is not turbulent motion. OK, so, you, so, yeah. so, so in you detail. Typically, okay. in practice, what you do is you pick a scale which contains enough resolution elements, enough cells, for example. So you, you work at 100 per six scale, say. And over this scale, you subtract the average motion, which is, for example, the resolution around the galaxy or the crazy motion in the, in the merger. And then what's left is this random motion based, what builds turbulence. And then you can decompose it, either L modes or with computing the curve or the divergence into solenoidal and compressive. So basically a related question, and it's related to the shocks. So when you, when you have this, this interaction, you get a lot of shocks plowing through the gas. Does it make sense to decompose the velocity field in these two components across shocks? That seems weird to me. I would say it depends on the scale. And, you know, because when, when, you, when you measure turbulence, the, the way I do it, you have to be very careful at which scale you're doing it the same way you, you compute the Mach number and everything. So, yeah, I, it's tricky. <laughs> uh, I think it's really dependent on, on the scale you are looking at if you include the, the full shock front or not. Last question. Uh, could you elaborate a bit more on how the nature of turbulence became? What do you mean by that? It's, yeah, it's basically saying that instead of having instead of having this kind of turbulence like that, like this, so when the, the mixing effect dominates, it's carrying two thirds of the energy, the, because of compressive tides, you change the turbulence and you get something like that. So when this mixing effect is much, uh, much less important, just two thirds more or less of the, of the energy. So you, you don't mix so much, but you compress much more. No, no, it's still turbulence. It's still turbulence, but instead of, of you know, having a, a solenoidal mixing effect, then what you do more is enhancing the contrast between low density and high densities. So you widen your gas PDF, for example. In terms of power spectrum. It's, it's not directly related to the power spectrum because you can do that at whatever scale you want. So you would not see, uh, I don't think you see a big difference in, in terms of power spectrum, but you see a difference in terms of um, density PDF. Because if you get more compressions like that, then you will get more dense gas. To reconcile with the work of Federas doing molecular cloud simulations so way smaller scales, but the, the first turbulence was uh, uh, you know, decomposed also in compressible and, and but at those scales, it doesn't seem to make a big difference. So how do you reconcile the two? It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference in terms of what? O of star formation, rate, uh, efficiency, and... I'm not so sure it doesn't make a difference. Well, in the end, you form stars in, you know, one threefold time and... For the same Mach number. I'm not sure about that. No, uh, what I'm saying is that the nature of the, whether it's compressible mm -hmm. or, or solenoidal 
didn't make a big difference. What made a big difference is the Mach number. The yes, yes. But the, the, the decomposition between was not making a big difference. Well, yeah, it does make a but difference. But again, it's not the same scale at all, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Much yeah. smaller scale. So, well, the, the main difference is that he has to force the turbulence, so it's arbitrary what he's doing. And here, in, in this kind of simulation, we don't force anything because it's coming from the large scale stuff. But uh, it does make a difference, even in, in increased of uh, simulations, because in, uh, in compressive mode, you see this PDF getting wider. You have this, this um, uh, width of the PDF, which depends on the Mach number and this B parameter he has, which is the ratio between solenoidal and compressive. So if you have a, a way of widening your PDF, it's either to increase the Mach number, so global turbulence, or to make it more compressive. And, and basically what we, what we found at Galactic Scale is that if you get a long normal PDF, you get a wider PDF if you increase the Mach number. And if you change the nature of the PDF, then you will get a wider one, but with not a log normal, with two peaks. Yes, yes, the Mach number is still the, the main uh, effect. But there is also a dependency on the, on the nature of the term, second order. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh